Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have Kimberly Collins here, and she is an author. She is an Enneagram and MBTI consultant, and she coaches also, and she's just an amazing individual, and she talks and, and helps about um, helping people and helping businesses grow and understand their coworkers. And she really goes into depth. So, and, you know, it really helps people, especially teams and businesses on how to make constructive de uh, business decisions and how to work together as a group so they can really grow and really excel in their business. And don't forget, we also have um, Kimberly Collins. Uh, she has her own podcast on our station. And she also uh, does, um, she, she is active in our podcast community. So you'll find her all over the place. So if you want to type her, her name in, you'll find her podcast and her episodes on her own channel. And don't forget to follow and to subscribe to our channel because we have a lot more episodes in the future that I think will benefit you. And remember, it's all about balancing all areas of your life. And these are the ways to do it. So don't forget to subscribe and listen to our future episodes. So Kimberly, it is an honor to have you back. I love when you come on the show. You know, I feel like decision making is so important and understanding your coworkers and being able to work as a team is vital. Now, when it comes to the MBTI, how, you know, for people who aren't familiar with it, maybe you can explain what it is and why it's such an important com component. Absolutely. So the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs um, is a personality typing system that was based on the work of Carl Jung. And so um, Catherine Cook Myers and her daughter, Isabel Myers-Briggs, took Carl Jung's work and they expanded it and they brought it to, you know, uh, testing and vetting it to try to bring it to the wider community. And it's used now very, very broadly in um, the workplace and colleges and career planning um, and relationship. It's a it's amazing test that's had a lot of history and way starting back in the World War II era when, um, you know, the Myers-Briggs duo brought Carl Jung's work um, into kind of their awareness and tried to start this expansion. Um, and they did so because they looked at the world around them in the chaos of World War II and said, you know what, I feel like maybe if we could understand each other better, we could prevent something like this from happening again. If, you know, the idea being that if we could see somebody else and their perspective, because Carl Jung introduced this idea that, hey, we don't all look at the world the same way. And if we could understand how somebody else is looking at the world, maybe we could create more understanding and prevent such horrible atrocities from happening again. So they, they decided to take this work, expand it, and try to bring it to the wider community. But the MBTI is really based on what we do in these four specific categories of human experience. So it's our behaviors, our decision-making, the way we um, take in direct energy, and uh, they take it and they codify it into a series of preferences. So in each of these four categories, there are two preferences. Um, and I, you know, we prefer one of these over the other. That does not mean that we cannot develop skills in the opposite preference. It doesn't mean that we haven't made adaptations in our lives so that we can function in a world that maybe prefer, you know, emphasizes a different preference. But it says, given the opportunity for us to make decisions or uh, direct our energy away or move about the world in a certain way, this is how we would do it. Um, and what's great about it is it shows that there's not one that's better than the other and that there's multiple ways, again, of seeing the world. Um, these four categories of human experience, and I'll just talk really, really briefly about it, just maybe to plant the seed for those who are maybe a little excited about the idea of personality typing systems. I always find them infinitely fascinating, of course, um, yeah. but to just kind of plant the seed to say, maybe you should go check it out and see if you can find out a little bit more about yourself. But these four categories of human experience, the first is extroversion and introversion. And this is how we prefer to direct and receive energy. It's the, you know, off the bat, it's a little bit complicated because extroversion and introversion has been co-opted by the popular lexicon. So it, it's really muddled with what the popular lexicon is saying it is, you know, extroversion does not mean that we're 
talkative or boisterous or energetic or perfect leaders and introversion does not mean that you're shy or awkward or don't like people. This is really in the Myers-Briggs world, we're talking about how we prefer if given the opportunity, we would direct and receive energy. So those with an extroversion pr preference, they prefer to direct and receive energy from the outside world. So it means that they get energy from the outside world and from the people that are in it. Um, and those with an introversion preference, they prefer to direct and receive energy from the inner world, from reflections and memories from their inner experience. And they like a little bit more time to be able to be in that space. So that's that first category of, uh, of, of human experience. The second is how we prefer to process information. So we have a sensing and an intuition preference. Those mm -hmm. with a sensing preference, they prefer to take in information through their five senses. So they're very tangible, concrete, present. They take in information and they kind of relate it to what past information was in these, these categories as well. Those with an intuition preference, they prefer to get information from patterns and from connections between data points. They are a little bit more abstract and they can be more creative in how they take in information. Uh, the next category is how we prefer to come to conclusions and make decisions. And that's our feeling and our thinking. Those are the two preferences. Those with a feeling preference, they prefer to put themselves into the situation. They like to look around at how this decision is going to affect the people around them, as well as affect themselves and the values that they hold internally. They like to make decisions that are compassionate and create more harmony. Um, it does not mean that they're more emotional. So that's not what feeling preference is. The, mm -hmm. the other preference is the thinking preference. And those uh, people with a thinking preference, they like to do the opposite. They like to take themselves out of the situation. They like to look at the situation with more objectivity. And they like to look at the bottom line and make decisions based on that logical, rational reasoning that kind of comes down to that decision. It does not mean that they won't adapt and make decisions that are helpful for the people around them. But again, given the opportunity with no expectations, they'll make decisions based on this logical thinking. Yeah. And the final preference pair is our um, how we prefer to move about the world. So that's our judging and our perceiving preferences. Those with a judging preference, they prefer to move about the world in a very structured, um, measured way. They like to close loops. They like to make stepwise projects uh, stepwise progress to projects and they hate last minute stress. And those mm -hmm. with the perceiving preference, they like to do the opposite. They like more freedom and flexibility. They like to be open to more information late into the project and a little last minute stress gives them a little bit of energy. So this is just like a really quick, uh, you know, summary of these four preference categories, we will all choose one of the preferences over the other in each of these categories. That does not mean that, you know, every person who say has the same preference pairing type is going to be, you know, on the sliding scale in the same degree to each of those preferences. And like I said, that doesn't mean that you haven't adapted skills to help you move about in a world. I know that those with a perceiving preference, they, you know, they like, you know, spontaneity and, and not to do stepwise movements. Well, they've had to do a lot of judging uh, skill adaptation in a world that requires stepwise movements. I just even think about my kids in school that they're required to, to really adapt, to be able to function in a world uh, like school or work. So mm -hmm. it's just saying that given the opportunity, this is how you would land. Um, and that there's there's still a lot of variety into that and a lot of uh, area for self-mastery um, as well as skill adaptation. Now, can you kind of be on the spectrum too, like have a little bit of maybe type one and a little bit of type two also? Absolutely, absolutely. So what's great about the Myers-Briggs uh, testing system is it's actually expanded over the years as well. So there's a step one test where you get your, your initial pairings, you know, so you're you're either an E or an I or an S or an N or an F or a T or a P or a J. Um, but now they've come up with a step two assessment. So it really breaks each of those four categories into five sits per category. So you can be, um, you know, an extrovert who doesn't really like groups, or you can be a, you know, an introvert who likes to uh, talk in front of people. So there's 
there's a lot of range for this. And you can also sit in the middle as well for a lot of those preferences. So um, say you're somebody who, uh, you know, again, I use extroversion and introversion because I think we can all relate to that one a lot. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those introverted extroverts or those extroverted introverts or whatever it is, um, um, you can lie right on the middle as well. I like that. And how does this affect your working relationships with your other coworkers? Because it, you know, you had mentioned that it can play a huge factor in how they work as a team, how they can excel. And even, and if you don't really figure it out and you don't really understand it well, it could also destroy a team, you know, if you're not understanding the other coworkers and employees and knowing how to, you know, deal with them too. Absolutely. So I, uh, Obvious, it, it it's amazing to be able to understand yourself better and being able to understand yourself better creates more self-awareness, which of course makes you easier to work. It, it helps your communication. It helps your conflict responses or maybe your feedback. Um, it's an important part of your own self journey. It's even more important, I would argue, for your interpersonal dynamic dynamics. Um, how much better can you show up to a relationship if you can understand how your communication patterns are just opposite of the other person um, and that be, being able to create that understanding already preemptively sets you up for better, better communication. That doesn't mean that conflict's not going to happen, but that mm -hmm. if we understand that we approach a project totally differently because one is a P and one is a J, we're going to have a little bit more understanding that you know, Sally isn't trying to be rude. She just likes to leave things open later. That's just yeah. how she likes to do it. Um, so it creates more understanding in that way. And also when the conflict happens, there's a, a way of being able to say, okay, I understand myself. I know how I showed up to the project and what I was kind of expecting. Now I know the other person and I know how they showed up to it and maybe what they were expecting. Now we can look at the problem and see where where we went off and how we can come to it sooner. Um, sometimes I feel like when conflict arises, it feels like this big black nebulous thing that nobody can understand where, you know, what happened. But being able to understand the people involved, it almost becomes like a ball of yarn where we we follow the trail in and say, okay, I see where it's knotted. We can just untie it here and create better pathways for communication. I feel like also this is also a very important component for um, managers, uh, business owners. I think if, you know, you really have to, you know, because I, what I see the biggest problem is, is that business owners or managers see things in a very structured like way, because that's their, you know, that's why they're successful because they're very structured. They, mm -hmm. they, they're visionaries. And, you know, they're very organized. You have to be in order to be a success in business. But, you know, a lot of them have this expectation that everyone's going to do things exactly the way they're doing it because their way is the only way. And I think that's where the problem arises. Now, you know, what's your intake about situations like that? Absolutely. And it's a, you know, it's a really interesting concept that we have a tendency surrounding ourselves as leaders of many versions of ourselves. And mm -hmm. there can be benefit to that, you know? So if there's a specific problem that requires a specific skill set, it's very tempting to bring around yourself a bunch of people who are just like you. Yes. Issue becomes then is, you know, that saying, we cannot solve problems using the same thinking we did to create it, um, right. is that when we get this very, uh, same way of thinking, we can create a problem that just starts to compound itself. Maybe we're very efficient at, you know, keeping a system going, but we never realize that the system is outdated and needs mm -hmm. to be changed. So it's that idea that, uh, yes, having employees who operate differently than you operate is maybe challenging, and it should be, because it helps you then be start thinking outside the box. And what's great about the MBTI is it helps to break down those different categories, um, especially that processing information and making decisions and kind of puts it out there and says, hey, there's people who are very, very tangible and they're gonna be looking at what can I see and feel um, and experience with my five senses. And then there's gonna be those that are more abstract and are seeing the connection between data points, but those with this tangible 
information processing can't see it. And we need yeah. both. Um, and it's very tempting to want us to all just lean on one side, but we, we lopside the scale then. And we're not yep. able to see the possibility and the change um, that we need to be taking to stay relevant in the business world um, yep. if we're not allowing space for the opposite preference to also be part of that team. I think it's so important. Um, you know, you made a really good point where sometimes um, the old ways are outdated, but the business owners don't see it because it's worked for so many years that they think it's going to continue to work. And then things start to decline. Numbers start to decline. Cons consumers start to decline and they're not understanding why, but, you know, times change. And, and as time changes, you know, the way we do things, the way we operate, the methods we use, you know, change dramatically. And, you know, I think that's really important, you know, and I would say that was like, probably like a type one, someone that's very, you know, stern in their ways and does things accordingly, you know, so if you have a boss or, you know, somebody like that, what's your advice to them to really make them open their eyes? Because it, sometimes it could be insulting, you know, because you have to be careful because, hey, this is my business. I've been doing this for so many years, or I've been in this, you know, position for so many years. And their ego sometimes could get in the way also, you know, how do you handle a situation like that? You know, and every situation is different, but I feel like remembering that, uh, you know, a relationship is just, it, it starts with a connection between two real people. And so you know, it's really important to, if anybody's trying to affect change in a corporation or in a business or with another person, the first place is always to start with yourself and understanding how do I communicate? How do I show up? How, how do I bring a fresh perspective to this? And then understanding the other person. Hey, like you said, there could be a lot of ego involved. There could be a lot of fear involved as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of time that ego is out there acting very bombastically, but really it's, it's sheltering this scared business owner behind it who's saying, I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. Please do not come in here and ask me to change more. I'm holding on. So it's yeah. understanding the other person and and giving grace in that as well. So, you know, if if you have, you know, creative, uh, more futuristic, probably even more uh, relevant ways of being in the business world, understanding that you're dealing with somebody who is under a lot of pressure as well and getting to know them and their situation so that when you have the great idea. It's it's an idea between two individuals who have a relationship. Um, yeah. I, I feel like what I see that doesn't work is somebody coming into an organization, ignoring everything that has come before them and trying to ramrod this change um, and kind of blaming the people around them for being irrelevant. It's change comes when there's a relationship between individuals and that there's trust, there's mutual trust, and mutual respect. That's the only way we can hear each other when we have something to say. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Definitely. Now, you know, what's the best way to teach the MBTI, you know, method to businesses and to small, you know, small businesses, medium business, or even corporate businesses? How do you, you know, what's the first step of, of teaching, you know, these, these methods and, and utilizing them? Absolutely. I'm going to be super annoying and say it starts with the leader always. <laughs> it's like <laughs> going to be always my answer to anything is, is bringing these personality typing systems, you know, Enneagram, Colby, MBTI, whatever, DISC, whatever you want to do, bring it in with the leader first. And the reason why I say that is that's where you're going to actually get the most change anyway. Um, the leader being able to understand their strengths and weaknesses, the leader being able to improve their communication, their conflict, their, their feedback patterns, all of that will help create psychological safety for the team so that the team can then use it. Um, so having that leader adopt it and have the buy-in for it as well is going to be the best way to bring it then to the team. Once the leader is on board and even when the leader has been using it a little bit and the team is able to experience that psychological safety a little bit more. And what I mean by psychological safety is that um, team members and leaders are able to express differing opinions. They're able to take interpersonal risks. 
They're able to make mistakes. They're able to give feedback without negative retaliation from their teammates or from their leaders. And this is incredibly important when we're looking at personalities that have shadow sides or things we're not good at or things that we wish were different. We need to be able to be safe to have those things discussed and explored on the team level uh, or, or it's not an effective tool at all. And I, in fact, it could really hurt your, hurt your team a lot. Um, right. So some of the worst ways to have, you know, hurt the psychological safety is having an unhealthy leader and to have a lot of gossip in the, in the workplace. So having that leader, you know, implement these tools for themselves and then have it affect the team and establish really safe boundaries would be the first thing you would do to bringing this into a team. And what would be the second thing? Because I would think this is not like a one day process. It's going to take oh, no. time. So what would be like, what are some of the steps that, you know, or, or you know, that, or, you know, that you see accordingly that will make it the most successful? Absolutely. So when you're bringing it to the team level, it's, uh, it's important to, um, you know, look at your organization and make sure that you're working with teams, not groups, but teams, usually teams can be anywhere between like, let's say five to 10 to 15 people, but people who have interpersonal dynamics that they really depend on each other. If you're just throwing it out to the group, it can be a little bit more overwhelming, but say you have a small business, um, small businesses can even have teams in the small business and it could be a matter of, you know, three to five people, but the, that team works really, really tightly together. Um, yeah. So it's, it's the most effective if you can implement it at the team level before you go to the group level, um, yeah. just because the team can then um, experience the data in a little bit more of a safe place, as mm -hmm. well as an interpersonal space that uh, the tool that they're learning is going to make more sense when mm -hmm. they're learning it about their teammate that they talk to every morning at 8 a.m. about the same project. Um, right. So that's a that's a more effective way to do that. Um, but first, it starts out with a personality type typing test. Um, the, it's not a test; it's an assessment. You know, people get a little bit nervous when they think they're taking a test. There is no right or wrong answer. Um, but probably the best way to bring it into the team le uh, level is to have a reputable assessment they're using. You know, the Myers Briggs company, of course, has a wonderful, wonderful assessment. You can do um, just the step one, or you can do step one and step two. Um, and then probably the next step would be double checking all the assessment uh, results. So having each team member either meet with a coach or consultant, or, you know, as a group meeting with the coach and a consultant, just to go over those nitty gritty things that might have felt a little nebulous when they were taking the assessment that makes more sense in a discussion. Um, right. And then after that, I would say the implementation of how that's going to affect the team, it's best used when there's a goal and that's set by the team leader. So, you know, the MBTI is a massive system. You could go to depths uh, that could take you you know, the rest of your lifetime to implement it with a team. So really focusing it in for the team members to start that process out is really helpful. So even saying something as, as minimal as, hey, uh, we're going to all take up this assessment. You're going to meet with this consultant and we're going to verify, we're going to learn about each other so that our, you know, we're going to be improving our communication over the next three months. And we're going to be, uh, you know, kind of noticing these kinds of differences, or we're going to be working on conflict patterns, or, um, you know, say if you're going to implement it to a leadership group, hey, we're going to be really helping you all prepare for leadership roles by understand your leadership style. So having yeah. a little bit more of a direction for it can help the team grasp onto what they should be focusing on, because it is such a wonderful deep system uh, that it can be a little overwhelming if you, if you don't have a goal. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of times too that there's so much that goes on with gossiping in every office and you know when you mentioned that and how destructive it can be do you have any advice for offices when you know because you know someone talking to X, Y, you know, Z talking about this one and that one. And, and, you know, it could really destroy relationships. It could destroy, you know, um, 
the way the functionality of the whole office because then you lose respect for each other. Are there ways that you can actually mix or just you know decrease it to a point where it's almost non-existent? You know, is there a way to turn that around? Yeah, and it, it is so hard. It is uh it is a temptation for every human relationship to yes. uh, uh to connect based on the mutual dislike of uh, another person. And yes. uh, if for one thing, it's establishing from the beginning to the leadership level, what the office policy is, but having the buy-in from the team. So it not instead of it being a top-down, like, hey, you know, if this, then this, though there is going to need to be that as well, but having the mutual buy-in from the people in the office, hey, has anybody ever experienced gossip? Uh, you know, has anybody felt the negative repercussions of that? Uh, what do you feel like when you have gossiped and now you are interacting with that person and really getting the conversation going with what gossip does to the person who's being gossiped about, to the relationship you're gossiping with, and to yourself? Uh, you know, if we are all good inside, and this is something that is against our true nature, then it doesn't feel good to talk poorly about somebody else. It might in the short shorthand because uh, you know you might be feeling like you're connecting with another person, um, yeah. but it's it's toxic to yourself. So it, it starts at that uh, again that team level. You can talk about it at the group level, which maybe you need to do both. But talking yeah. about it at the team level and then having a, a company policy that really outlines what is gossip. Uh, the gossip is talking about somebody else who is not there in a negative way, period. If you're not part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. It's gossip. Um, and and even helping uh, people understand what gossip is. And if there is actual significant issues that are happening, what are the steps that you need to take to um, have the actual issue uh, taken care of? I think that there's a little bit of that being an issue as well is that if um, employees don't understand the chain of command of how to solve issues, then what results is kind of this, you know, on level talking to their neighbor about how much they hate the new system yeah. or whatever it is. Um, so I think there's a little bit of understanding what gossip is, what the chain of command is, if there is truly an issue and what the consequences are if there is gossip. And, and then you know, leadership needing to hold those standards, you know, kind of hold the line and the boundary um, of yeah. what happens if there is gossip. Um, it might take time. It might take coaching. It might take a uh, follow-up, but it's important enough to put the energy in to really squashing that, that gossip. If there is pervasive gossip in a organization, you will feel it as the employee and as the leader and you'll feel yeah. it on your bottom line you'll feel it in your uh in your profitability and your productivity and your efficiency yeah. because the system isn't isn't working how it should i believe you know it, it sounds also too that the you know the mbti could also help with consumer relations and understanding mm -hmm. your consumer mm -hmm how to react to your consumer so you get, you know, the best, you know, um, outcome. So you can actually increase your profits, you know, because if you right. understand the type of person you're dealing with, it seems like this could actually, you know, help you grow as a business in, in that respect too. Absolutely. I mean, really a sales and consumerism, it's all about the relationship, you know, uh, Consumers are more likely to work with companies that they enjoy working with. And it's becoming that way more and more uh, where people are buying with their relationships a little bit. And so um, you might not be able to get, you know, the, the MBTI type of every person who comes in, but you will become more adept at being able to read. Uh, what the person in front of you uh, is really seeking or really wanting, or maybe, you know, maybe you're on the other end and you're in the customer service getting the call about, you know, something not going well, but you can understand what maybe has triggered this reaction. You know, all yeah. these personality typing systems, the MBTI, Enneagram, Colby, DISC, it's all about improving your own emotional intelligence so yes. that you can respond instead of react. You can make healthy choices instead of 
just waffling or uh, falling to whatever stimuli is in front of you. So when you do get that bad call from, uh, you know, the customer who's upset about something, it's you taking the deep breath and saying, okay, it <laughs> sounds like this is the thing underneath it. And now I can speak to that. Um, and I can cut my own ego out of this and be able to really solve it. Yeah. You know, I've actually used the MBTI to to help me even with my my own personal relationships and friendships. Absolutely. You know, because I I you know under you know because sometimes you know when you have friends they can be great people but they have different personalities and they do things differently and sometimes because like we were talking about in the beginning we do things a certain way and then we see them doing a certain way it's like sometimes their their habits could like sometimes get on your nerves because it's like why are they have to be so perfect why do they have to always be you know so like you know a b c d you know it's like why can't you just like loosen up a little you know and not take things you know get so nervous or whatever you know and that's more of a laid back type of personality i guess you know and but it's you know but those laid back personalities you know like for me like i'm a little bit more i could be an alpha or i could be a beta so it's like i you know according to what the situation is and and there are many times where you know i'll do, work on things but i get my most energy towards the end when I know I'm under pressure is when I really get like this positive energy like all right I got to do it I got to make sure everything's great and you know where a type one type person would that would drive them up a wall you know so it's like you know it's like when you have friendships and relationships and you take the MBTI to your personal level you know what are some ways to, you know, do you think in your own personal experience when you have friends or you have partners or you have family members that are completely different than you, you love them, but some of their ways could drive you up a wall, you know, how do you, you know, deal with that? Because it's the same method, you know, at work and everything else, but, you know, it's just on a more personal, emotional level. So how do you take that in and, you know, add it to your daily lives when it comes to your family and friends? Absolutely. And I think that sometimes when we bring it to our family and friends, it feels even more personal. And so it's even more important. Um, yeah. But it is, it can be a little bit trickier too, especially say we get a few kids involved and, you know, here we are a certain personality type and we've got these little other personality types and we just don't understand how you could possibly see the world that way because you know, I'm your mother. Um, so it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so important though, you know, again, coming to that self-awareness, you know, so if, if you are a very, you know, structured, you know, judging type, you like to go from point A to point B and here's all the steps and you close all the loops and you, you know, you never have last minute pressure is understanding that's you and that's great. And that's not them. And they're never going to change that. You can teach a dog uh, you can teach a cat to bark as much as you want. And at the end of the day, they're going to say meow. That is what they're <laughs> going to do. And so understanding that it's almost a relief to say, I, at some point, cannot influence somebody to be different than they are. Yes. And if that is the case, what do I need to do to protect my peace? Maybe that means that I'm going to uh, do everything I can in a project and I'm working on it with a friend and they're, you know, they work totally different than I, and I'm just going to let go of those last pieces and say, they're just going to do it the way that they're going to do it. Or say, I get really anxious about this, that, and the other thing. And I'm just going to allow myself to be anxious, put the boundaries up that I need to around the people that operate differently than I do. Um, or I'm going to embrace that difference and say, hey, uh, you see connections of patterns and I see the tangible world. Maybe we work together on these parts, but it's a lot of that self-awareness first. Uh, if we can be more self-aware and realize how entrenched these preferences are, there's really no making yourself not be the way that you are. You can adapt skills, but that requires energy to do yeah. that. Um, yeah. And conscious thought. It's mm -hmm. like signing your name with your left hand or, or your non-dominant hand. Um, you can practice it and practice it and you'll get okay at it, but it's still going to require Hot, and it's going to be a little awkward and it's going to take energy where it's your preferences they're in there and you're just you're doing your thing when you're in there so it it creates a little bit of grace knowing that I am so entrenched in this way no matter how many times yeah. I try to change it and they're the same they're entrenched in how they are um, and so understanding that it's also helpful just understanding especially in a really close relationship 
uh, you know, friendships or partners or um, even kids. So I do caution on typing kids at young ages. You know, that should be something that uh, probably happens in their like late teens, early 20s. Um, yeah. They're just developing so much and they're so influenced by your de decision. So or your opinion. So let them kind of come to that maybe young adult ages. Um, but especially, you know, partners and friendships is understanding them more will help you appreciate what they bring to the table more. And to help you just, again, give that grace and saying, that's fantastic. You see the world totally different or that you want to leave the party because you're super introver introverted and you really do hate all the socializing um, that you can give grace there instead of frustration. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a, gr a great answer. Now, you wrote a book. Now, tell everybody about your book. And if you have a copy in front of you, let everybody see it also, because I really wanted to learn more about this because your book is really doing great. And I, you know, I think it would benefit so many people. Absolutely. So I, I wrote about the Enneagram in the workplace. So this is the book. And uh, what's great about this book is that I applied it specifically to what your day would look like when you're you're in the workplace. So, you, you know, you're running around, you're having in, interactions with people that may be um, very crazy to you. You know, you just don't quite understand what is happening. And this is really a reference guide. You're able to go to the different types of the Enneagram and you understand your type. You're able to see maybe what your triggers were in that in that situation, maybe what your communication patterns are, or your conflict style, and then being able to look at the other person and say, hey, uh, this is their triggers. These are their communication styles. And yeah. this is how maybe you triggered them, or maybe this is how you're in this pattern. Um, yeah. And and being able to just understand the other person. I have to also have parts in there that talk specifically about how each type might interact with these other types. So um, you know, as a type two, how you might be interacting with a type five and how that might be triggering them, what specifically you do that triggers them and vice versa. Um, yeah. So just being able to give this kind of reference quick guide to all the ideas behind the Enneagram that make it more understandable for the day to day, the very rushed, hurried, uh, you know, moment by moment interactions that you would have. I also yeah. have parts of it that speak to conflict and how, uh, you know, possible ways of approaching conflict between team members or even with leaders and team members of saying, you know, again, understand yourself, understand the other person, understand the situation with just the facts, no stories involved. Um, and then being how could we have interpreted this different and let's come to a solution. So there's the idea that before we, you know, confront each other, we've yeah. done a little bit of work on you know, chilling out a little bit, getting yeah. down to the facts of what is happening and how can we move forward on that? It doesn't mean that every conflict can be avoided or every conflict would necessarily be solved, but it would take out uh, the drama of it a little bit and put it more into terms that we could grasp and maybe uh, create more grace and understanding around. Yeah. Oh, I think that's awesome. Now, where can people find your book? Absolutely. So it's on Amazon. So it's Enneagram in the workplace. And you can also find it on my website, which is uh, EnneagramReflections.com. And you can find information about podcasts I've been on. I have a, a blog about different topics of Enneagram or just workout uh, workplace stuff. I'm working on a series about burnout, um, especially with leaders, which I think is really, really important. Uh, you know, the health of our leaders is paramount to the health of our businesses. Um, and you can also find more information about my book and uh, services that you can use for leaders and teams as well. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you really want to emphasize on some important factors, what would be some of the things you'd like to express to the listeners? Absolutely. I would say uh, learn more about yourself, whether that is the MBTI, Enneagram, Colby, DISC, whatever it is, or just you know, really great self-reflection, learn more about yourself so that you can interact with others in a more positive way. I love it. Now you have a newsletter also that people can sign up to, right? Yes, absolutely. And you can find more about that on my, uh, on my website as well, or on my Instagram, which is Enneagram Reflections. I love it. And what, tell everybody your website URL so they can go to your website. Absolutely. It's EnneagramReflections.com. 
I love it. And also, um, just so people understand, what are some of the services that you provide so they know all the different things that you're doing right now? Absolutely. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with um, leaders or with uh, team members or, you know, any really anybody who feels like they're they're in a place where they could use just a little bit of extra support but you know especially those uh, team leaders and team members and then i also consult at the team uh, level so that can be anything from um you know, working with a smaller group and working with a, one of these personality tools or with conflict in general, or coming in and doing presentations about these personality typing um, tools that will help create more understanding and harmony in the workplace. Oh, I love it. I love it. This has been amazing. You know, Kimberly, you, I, I love the fact that you, you do this because I think it's so important, you know, if, cause a lot of times people don't take the time to understand another person, the way they react to things, the way they do things, why they do things the way they do. And they just, they, they build a wall right away and they're not accepting mm -hmm. that. And, you know, people have to realize that not everybody is like themselves, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to really be open to different personalities. And once you're willing to be open to different personalities, as long as they're getting the job done and they're doing it the way they're supposed to, you know, that's all you really need. And, and you just have to understand why they react the, the way they do, mm -hmm. understand their personality, understand their way of thinking. And you could have such a great relationship with that person and, you know, and you could have such a great working experience with that person, mm -hmm. but you have to be mm -hmm. willing to understand and accept the other person. And the first step is, is the MBTI is understanding their personality and why they mm -hmm. do the things they do. And so, you know, today was a great show. I think, you know, this is something that people really need to dive into. I think businesses really need to dive into it because like we mentioned also, it's great for the business. It's great to work with consumers, you know, it's great to work with, you know, other peers and other, you know, other companies, if you're collaborating, you know, you want to understand, you know, the other people as well, who you're dealing with. So you can have that positive relationship with them and maybe establish, you know, future, you know, collaborations and future deals mm -hmm. with them also. And on a lower level, you know, your consumers, you want to understand your consumers, you want to understand the people who come through your door or the people that you're working with over the phone, you know, it's so so important and again the personal level you know it's mm -hmm. great for relationships mm -hmm. because it can save relationships it can save friendships you know it's just understanding why they are the way they are accept it and learn how to do you know make a healthy and productive relationship with that person not expecting that person to you know be like you because like you said you can try to teach them all you want to bark but at the end of the day that cat's gonna go meow you know yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so true Yes, absolutely. And it, to remember too, that we, we all assume, we all perceive ourselves as being incredibly rational human beings, that yeah. the way we respond is the way that everybody would respond if they were me. And, exactly. and so understanding that, uh, you know, that's how we perceive the world and every other person feels the exact same way. And yeah. so when we can kind of accept that and understand that when they're responding in a way to us, that they are seeing that as totally rational, then we can yeah. go, and why is that rational to you? So that we can have a better relationship. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, Kimberly, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I encourage our listeners to go to her podcast, listen to her other episodes. She has amazing episodes. She has amazing insight. And her name is Kimberly Collins. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. She'll be on and she has a lot of other episodes she'll be sharing with us. So stay tuned, listen. And like I said, follow and subscribe because over here, we are very serious when it comes to finding your balance in all areas of your life. Because when you can find balance, you could succeed and elevate to any level in life. And you are part of that. You know, you are part of that community that's making this happen. So thank you. And I appreciate you so much, Kimberly. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. <laughs>